This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at VAChamber.com. Virginia hospitals and health systems provide jobs. They support our economy and promote public health. Local hospitals are always open to help people with unexpected health needs. Having a stable health care network is vital. Virginia hospitals are our lifeline. I just received a letter from a student who thanked me for instilling the love of math in him. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association. Because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond. As our regular viewers know, we always have exciting guests and always great guests, but today it's ex very unique in that we have our first couple that we've had a wife-husband or a husband-wife team, the first one to be on this week in Richmond together. I'll tell our viewers it's, it's not the James Carville, Mary Madeline show because you both, uh, you don't have the differences that the two of them have, not, simply not in age, but also not in political persuasion. But really delightful to have you, Kelly, to be on as the Secretary of the Commonwealth and Clark to be on as the Chief of Staff for the Lieutenant Governor. We were talking before the show that you two met working with Mark Warner, um, governor, working with Governor Warner, was it, at the time, or then Senator Warner, but it went back in the Warner era that mm -hmm. you met. and. Kelly, you were saying, and our viewers I think would find it interesting, that, that you're not the only couple That's right. who met during the <laughs> Warner era. That's right. We uh, A few years ago we tallied them up and I think we found uh, seven or eight couples at least who had uh, had met working for uh, Governor or, or Senator Warner and, um, and had resulted in marriage and babies and all sorts <laughs> of uh, lasting impacts of the, the Warner days. Oh, well, I'm sure that Senator Warner has taken full credit Absolutely. for all this, and maybe in his <laughs> Senate office and his district offices, he uh, he still may be connecting people who uh, end up dating and then getting married. You you both, I believe, are from Virginia, from Richmond and from Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Went to different colleges, VCU and then Yale, and then getting a master's degree from George Washington mm -hmm. University. I think our, our viewers, while very interested. And, and that, but, but many couples of your age and even of my age uh, balance careers of both people working, so that's not so much the subject, that, that's more routine nowadays. But uh, would be interested, what does the Secretary of the Commonwealth do? We had LeVar Stoney on some time ago, but our viewers may have forgotten what he said, <laughs> and to have a Chief of Staff on for Lieutenant Governor, so let's start off by telling the viewers some of what, what's the typical week, there may not be a typical day or an hour, but what's the typical week in the yeah. life of each of you? That's a great question because I often say that we're probably the least understood cabinet secretary for oh, sure. I'm sure. Yes. Secretary of Education or Agriculture, and you can at least guess maybe some of the right. things that they work on. But the Secretary of the Commonwealth's um, Office has a, a lot of different uh, functions helping um, facilitate some of the official actions that the powers vested in the governor. So the, the things that we're 
ha historically have been most well known for were appointments to boards and commissions, which is a very important part of, of what we do in the Secretary of the Commonwealth's Office. And we can get a little bit more into that if you want, but of course we've got almost 300 um, boards and commissions that help, uh, help govern the state. And um, on behalf of the governor, my office helps find um, the candidates to serve on, on those boards and commissions for the, the governor to make those appointments. Um, we make about 1,000 appointments a year and so that's a big piece of what we do and, sure. and sort of what we've been most well known for. Uh, recently, of course, we have uh, have become um, more well known for restoration of civil rights, which is uh, an important function and power that's vested in the governor, um, returning, uh, restoring rights to individuals who have been convicted of a felony conviction in the past. So in addition to that, we handle uh, uh, commission notary publics. We um, handle service of process, lobbyist registrations, extraditions, uh, clemency, and um, and uh, we also are the, of course, the keeper of the the seal, yes. as uh, as well as the. Um, and a few years ago, the General Assembly passed legislation designating the Secretary of the Commonwealth as the official liaison to our um, state Indian tribes. So. You know, speaking of uh, keeper of the seal, I had the occasion, and maybe many others have had too, to wonder: Could I use the seal, a certain portion of it, on any publication? And uh, Fortunately, I knew to check in advance, and, and so I didn't violate any any law on that. But I, I would imagine that many people think, well, the seal's there, and they can just use it, and and uh, probably use it without without permission, and may not be using it legally. Yep. Every once in a while, we find those folks who are a little <laughs> overzealous in the use of the seal, and we kindly ask them not to do that. But again, the um, the state seal is, is used for government purposes, and um, and folks uh, contact our office seeking permission to yeah. use that. And, and it does. You'll you'll find that on a lot of a lot of things. There's a lot of official uh, <laughs> uh, uses of the seal around the Commonwealth. But um, I think it's a little uh, confusing sometimes for folks in Virginia because the uh, our, our state flag obviously bears the 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 seal as prominently featured on the flag and so the uh, the flag the use of the flag and the image of the flag is not uh, regulated in any way but the seal itself is so so if the flag is flowing and the seal mm -hmm. is seen on the flag that's one thing but it's different from the flag mm -hmm. some of our viewers may remember and it's on YouTube so they could ar like it's archived they could find it but years ago we did a I think an entire program on the seal, mm. uh, and particularly on the other side of the seal. As some great. people think it's there's one sided, but there's a interesting story for another day on the other side. Uh, Clark, so get in the conversation some about sure. what's uh, chief of staff. Sure. Um, I always qualify it when I say I'm chief of staff. Lieutenant governor's office is small. We have three full time employees, and um, that the staff has changed size over over the years. Um, it was it was actually um, you know, much larger uh, 20 years ago. So the size of government folks talk about lieutenant governor's office has uh, has, has become smaller in size over the years. It's uh, officially a part-time position, uh, like a senator or a delegate. So lieutenant governor gets paid roughly what a state senator gets paid. Um, although there's the expectation, I think, from a lot of folks that he's full-time. Uh, the position is full-time in a lot of other states. Uh, constitutionally, he presides over the state senate. So when they're in session. Um, just like Speaker Howe presides over the House, so we, we spent a lot of time just getting him ready uh, for each session, you know, what, what they're going to go through that day and, 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 uh, and the process of handling a floor session. He doesn't engage in the debates um, that go on in the floor session. He moderates them or referees them, uh, which, uh, which can be contentious at times. So he needs to make sure he knows what's going to come up for a vote and how to move things along and, and get folks in and out of there on time. Uh, he also serves on about a dozen boards and commissions. And so... Uh, and they're varied. He's the vice chair of the Fort Monroe Authority, which is close to him in Hampton, uh, which is just an incredibly historic site that was turned over from the Army to the Commonwealth a few years ago. It's the, the first place in America where a slave or stolen African arrived uh, uh, to the country, and it's the first place a slave was freed through the contraband decision. And, and, and not enough folks know that story, so we're working to, to elevate Fort Monroe's prominence in the state. He's on the Virginia Economic Development Partnership and Tourism Authority. And, and that was uh, Lieutenant Governor Bolin when he was uh, promoted to Chief Jobs Officer under Governor McDonnell. He assumed a couple more responsibilities with economic development. So Lieutenant Governor Northam inherited that. Um, we get constituent services that come in, just like the governor's office, folks that have problems with you know, any number of things. You know, you can guess a DMV or, 
or a school issue they might have or a visa issue, uh, a recommendation for a military academy, and, and we you know, have to get back to those folks. It's important. So that's a full-time position. Um, so, so we don't have a lot of staff, but we, we, uh, we, make, uh, we make work what we have. And then the lieutenant governor, he still lives in Norfolk full-time, um, and that's a little bit unusual. We had uh, Lieutenant Governor Hager, Lieutenant Governor Kane, and Bolin all lived, called Richmond home for a number of years. So folks were, were used to the lieutenant governor living in Richmond. So now we have a lieutenant governor who lives in Norfolk. And I think for, for the last 40 or 50 years, folks were used to the lieutenant governor either being independently wealthy or having a spouse that mm -hmm. might work. Lieutenant mm -hmm. Governor Bolian worked and, and sold insurance, but Lieutenant Governor Northam is still seeing patients at the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters in Norfolk. So he sees patients about three days a week. Um, and then he is the, uh, the medical director, volunteer medical director of our state's only hospice, which is in Portsmouth. It's a, a children's hospice. And so he's busy. So we have a, a major uh, calendar to manage between his medical schedule, his lieutenant governor schedule, and he is busy uh, running for governor next year in 2017, which adds uh, another element of his schedule that we're mindful of. So it's a lot of balls in the air. And many of those uh, boards and commissions, I think, are statutorily uh, determined, so it's not as though he just volunteers and I'll be on this and be on that. So those, those, in my opinion, have increased over the years mm -hmm. while there hasn't been any kind of increase in compensation to speak of. Yeah, and, no, uh, a lot of them are ex-officio positions. Uh, he wanted to serve on the Fort Monroe Authority, living close to Fort Monroe, know how important it was. But no, I mean, it's a, it's a conversation that comes up that he's stretched a little bit thin, um, but it's certainly not something that, that we would bring up to the General Assembly if they if they took a look at the office and the roles and responsibilities and thought it would be appropriate to, to change the size or staffing or our scope. But we are, he is quite happy uh, with what his scope is now and, uh, and, and just you know, chugging along. So. You know, you talked about the difference in the size of staff 20 years ago. Now, I was thinking there's, I think there's more staff in the Secretary of the Commonwealth's office oh. than in the Lieutenant Governor's office by one or so. And, uh, the the legislature has certainly over the years been the one that's reduced the size of the staff of the lieutenant governor and uh, reduced the office budget. I mean, so the I think that we're, we're, I'm not suggesting a complaint at all, but just saying that it's not just a, a voluntarily necessarily reducing the size of the staff. Right. Well, I think Kelly's office is is, is more than just one. About thirty. About 30 folks? Or? We've got 16 full-time employees, so and then a number of uh, part-time employees, and uh, we, we have a regular um, uh, cadre of interns as well from right. our local um, colleges and universities around Richmond. We're lucky to have so many uh, uh, great institutions here that, uh, that have a lot of willing interns that are um, unfortunately for them, unpaid, um, but uh, but really great folks willing to mm -hmm. learn and, and help out in the office as well. So. Yeah, and I think in our office, I mean, we have three folks, and I, I think when they when they started the the state up and, and, and wrote the constitution, envisioned the lieutenant governor's office. I mean, uh, you know, your citizen legislators, folks that have full time jobs, they go back to it. I mean, I think that's a, a good thing. I think they got it right. And mm -hmm. lieutenant governor, you know, a big part of who he is is seeing patients every week and. Uh, and that's important for his schedule. Uh, I mean, that, that grounds him. It gives him some real purpose and perspective. I mean, we always, I always think everything we're dealing with is the most important thing, you know, in the world mm -hmm. at that moment. And he'll remind me, or his medical schedule will remind me that, that it's not. Um, that being said, there is, a, there is certainly an impression that it's a full-time position. You have a, a governor that has, you know, literally hundreds, if not thousands of folks that report directly to him, a attorney general with a, with a few hundred people, and then our office has three. So it's, you know, but we try to keep pace, and I think we right. do a good job. And, and uh, the, the delegates and senators as, as well. I mean, the people are surprised to hear that they're part-time, and they have, you know, one aide who, who does everything. Um, That's right. So, yeah. That's right. So what, uh, what led you to get into a career that has brought you to this place where now you're chief of staff? I know you, Clark, you did some work on a congressional uh, commissioned uh, study that was done, and you involved some in politics, and then... Were you straight out of VCU working with Senator Warner? I was. I was uh, out of VCU. I started working on his um, his gubernatorial campaign. Actually, my last semester of college, I was interning on his campaign. So you were an intern. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Um, 
it, even when you get paid on campaigns, it's it's not much more than an unpaid internship position. But uh, right. uh, started out interning on his campaign, was planning to go back to school and, and um, to graduate school. And uh, Anita Rimler, who would become his secretary of the Commonwealth, was my, my boss at the time. And she convinced me that I could go back to school anytime and I should stick around and, and help out and see if we could uh, get him to the governor's office. And so that happened and, and um, was honored to go work in the governor's office with Governor Warner. And, um, and, and just have enjoyed it so much and, and love working um, on behalf of the Commonwealth in Virginia and all the capacities that I've had the chance to do so. But it's, uh, I can't public service is where my heart's at and uh, it's it's an honor to be here. And Clark, you summed her along the way, you worked on a master's at George sure. Washington University, but what, what got you really into politics? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, when I was in school, high school and college, I was involved civically and um, grew up in Alexandria and uh, I came back from, uh, from college and coached at my old high school, T.C. Williams. I remember the Titans and uh, I uh, started volunteering on some local campaigns and went to grad school for my master's in public policy and went and worked at a defense firm, uh, which, which I enjoyed, but I realized kind of at a young age uh, to be successful in that field, uh, to go out and get some experience and come back and consult later in my career might make sense. And so I took a, I took a pretty big pay cut. Uh, there was a campaign coming up in 07 for president and, and one for Senate with Mark Warner. And it was a historic election, so this is a time that I can afford to do this and get this experience under my belt. And so I went to work for the, the Warner campaign, and we worked closely with the, the coordinated campaign and the presidential campaign at the time. Um, and that's where I met Kelly. I uh, immediately fell forward, tried to keep that under wraps on the campaign, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah. knew that was a relationship that, I wanted to, to, that we wanted to continue. And so when that campaign wrapped up, Jim Webb, Senator Webb, had uh, started a commission on wartime contracting, looking at how we contract for, for uh, goods and products and services uh, in a war zone in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I served on that using some of the knowledge I'd picked up at the defense consulting firm and, and did that until the, the, the commission sunset. So I got to go to Iraq and Afghanistan, Qatar, Kuwait, Germany, and interview a lot of our contractors mm -hmm. overseas. And uh, we moved down here. Uh, we have a son and daughter. We moved down here when our son was born um, to continue for Kelly working for Senator Warner. And, and along the way, I got to, I'd always known about Senator Northam. I uh, got to know him personally, and um, I yeah, just think the world of him. I mean, politics aside, he's got a, a biography that just, I think a lot of Virginians uh, can be really proud of. He's a, you know, Army veteran, Virginia Military Institute grad, and, and uh, you know, pediatric neurologist, and just everything about him uh, attracted me to go work for him. And so while we're a small office, we report to someone who, who's in it for the right reasons. Um, and I got to know him fairly well when he ran for lieutenant governor they needed someone to play his opponent uh, in debate prep and uh, and so I played um, his opponent who's E.W. Jackson and that that is a unique experience getting you know listening to someone else and, and kind of trying to figure out their mannerisms and rhythm and then playing that person in, in debate prep and so I get very nervous when I hear about all the debates happening at a national level right. this makes me makes my heart race a little bit but if you can get through that experience and still get along and have a good working relationship you know, it's a it's a good thing, good sign of things to come. So, so here I am. Yeah. And you're both in in positions working with people who will no longer be governor. <laughs> time will come, and no longer be lieutenant governor. So. Uh, some might say it wasn't the smartest <laughs> career move for us both to both to um, take on jobs that end in January of uh, of 2018. So yes. Yeah, so We'll both be unemployed at the yeah. same time come the end of this term. So, so. apart from our posting your resumes, <laughs> <laughs> what, what 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 are what are what, where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself doing the similar work in another office, or or what's uh, what's ahead for this dynamic duo? Yeah, you know it's hard to say this far out, but um, but I think for both of us, definitely public service is something that uh, that is important, and um, and kind of helping and shaping and giving back to the Commonwealth. So I don't I don't know what the the future holds and hopefully it holds something and not just yeah, unemployment right. in January of, of right. 18. But um, but I think we'll continue to to stay involved and engaged with the um, in Richmond. E either one of you ever consider running for office? I think Kelly should. Yeah. We uh, <laughs> you know we moved we had a, a big lifestyle change. We moved from Alexandria to, to Hanover County, a town of Ashland and uh, you know, we've, uh, we've kind of put down roots there. We love the town, love the community, and, and we'd love to stay. And obviously public service in Richmond is different than public service in Washington. We're 
there are lots and lots of different opportunities right. in the D.C. area, whether it's working for government or working for advocacy or, or any number of the agencies. Uh, here, you're, you're a little bit more limited. So we're, we're aware of that. We don't try to think about it too much. I mean, we both have jobs to do, uh, and if we do them well, you know, hopefully that will lead sure. to more opportunities. At the same time, we have a mortgage. <laughs> we have two kids. We have expenses, so it's something we don't completely ignore. Um, but I, I think to, to get something after this, uh, it's important to do your current job as, as well as possible. And that's the kind of how we approach things. Although it's, it's not lost on us. That, right, uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm gonna ask you something that I don't typically ask guests if we have two on together. And that would be, <laughs> Kelly, what question should I have <laughs> asked Clark to bring something else out? And Clark, what's a good question to ask Kelly to bring out something else that, that would interest our viewers? So, uh, which one of you would have the... It's a curveball. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> uh -huh. um, do you have any? I'm thinking right now. Yeah. I'm looking. Uh, I, you know, I, I would... I don't know what the question would be, but I would say that, um, that in addition to all of our responsibilities in the office, we're involved in a lot in the community, too. And uh -huh. Clark serves on a number of, uh, of, of boards in Ashland. Um, as do I, and so we do a lot in our in our community of Ashland too, and, and kind of volunteer and community service outside of of our work too is I think a big piece of of our lives. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but I don't I can't think of any really like, really good juicy questions for you to uh, to help. Well, I wasn't necessarily Clark. looking for the juice. We're <laughs> not trying to get yeah. any kind of uh, uh, scoop. This is PBS, so <laughs> no, I, I, you know I would think you know for. Uh, you know, outside of work, we, we, we do a lot, but, you know, kind of not, you know, a lot of folks don't know the full breadth of what the Secretary of Commonwealth's office does, and I would kind of be curious with what was pitched to you coming into the job and what it is now, kind of what was the, what would have been the biggest surprises? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, obviously, when I uh, was sworn in as Secretary in, on April 15th, um, it, uh, my job quickly morphed into something that it had not ever been um, in, in history with a week later, the governor making a very historic announcement on the steps of the state capitol on, right. on restoration of rights. And that has definitely dominated a lot of my time um, this spring and summer um, with the kind of ups and downs of, of that process and, and all that that's entailed. Uh, in addition, I'd say um, the secretary of the Commonwealth's office has uh, has never been in the news so much as it has been this summer. Uh, and so right. that was a piece of it that uh, that is not, um, it's when you asked about uh, ever running for office, I sort of chuckled because I have always very much relished my job behind the scenes and, and kind of doing the work right. and letting somebody right. else be the face of that. I'm very comfortable in that position. And so um, taking on the, the job as Secretary of the Commonwealth was a huge honor and something I was very excited to do that work, but I would, um, I uh, am very happy to to not um, see my name in the paper or get any recognition at all for the work that we do. And so it's been a it's been a little uh, it's it's been an interesting summer um, having so many um, radio interviews and TV interviews and kind of focus on the work that we're doing in the office has has been um, not necessarily what I anticipated. Right. But and and I don't know if we brought it out earlier in the show, but you were deputy secretary of the Commonwealth. Right. Someone may saying. How did this young person get to be named Secretary of the Commonwealth? But you, you were serving right in the number two spot in that. And so when, the, yeah. when the Secretary left, it was... You You've were, been very kind to not ask that question. Most people, um, I think there are uh, a lot of people, despite their their kind of upbringing and what their mama taught them to not ask about a lady's age. Um, people <laughs> people are usually not so um, reserved when they see me just because I, I know I look young and so I have a lot of incredulous um, meetings with people where they can't believe that I could actually like be qualified to do my job at all. So um, when I worked for, I worked for Mark Warner for 13 years and towards the end of my term I'd have meetings with with folks in DC and you know lobbyists would bring their their clients and I worked a lot with local governments and with with um, institutions but anybody who came through the door you know I could say like oh, I've worked for Senator Warner for 13 years and you can see the wheels start <laughs> right. turning in their brain and yeah, when you know, did she start yeah, yeah everybody's favorite joke is oh so you must have started when you were 10 uh, uh -huh. um, but yeah. <laughs> right Right. So, yes. and indeed, I did finish college and uh, and have been in the workforce for a long time, and think I'm old enough to be here. <laughs> yes, yes, to be one of the governor's cabinet members, and that and that probably has pulled you into meetings that you didn't necessarily attend. All those meetings in your first. 
two and a half or more years as mm -hmm. deputy secretary. So that's added another responsibility. And and as comparing the size of the staff, I would think that you're you're in a lot of more supervisory administrative roles than uh, a chief of staff would be with yeah. just oh, a couple to be of other clear, people. I, I just need to find a job where I can drive her into work every day. <laughs> uh, so I have a good office to go to, but there's no right. question, Kelly. Right. Uh, uh, it's it's, it's yeah. pretty impressive to see what she's doing in her position. Would you believe our time is up? But thank thank both of you for being on This Week in Richmond. I really thank appreciate you. it. It's thank great you. to be here. Thanks, right. David. Thanks. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. For jobs, the economy, and public health, Virginia Hospitals, our lifeline. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.